All right, here's the story. I started doing stand-up comedy when I was 14. I'll never forget the first time I was on stage. The guy that introduced me was a guy named J.T. Newton. I'm 47. I can close my eyes and remember the introduction like it was yesterday. It went like this. Ladies and gentlemen, this next young man coming to the stage is starting his comedy career tonight. Who knows? We may be witnessing the birth of a star. Please welcome David Chappell. <laughs> From the first time that I ever held a microphone, I was sure this was it. I knew I was home, I knew I had found my thing, and my God, man, my God, man, I was a child. I got good. Matter of fact, I was good from the moment I started. And I'm not saying this to be a bragging, I'm telling you the truth. These old niggas was in awe of me. How was this little boy so poised, they used to say. I was. I mean, you know, I got better, but it started out good. About a year into it, when I was 15 years old, I had written a joke during the AIDS epidemic about having a good year condom. Something, I don't even remember the joke. Something about an industrial strength condom by Goodyear. <laughs> I just remember all the comedians really liked that joke. And there was an older comedian. And he came to me one night after the show, after he saw the joke, and he said, listen, I got an audition at another comedy club, and I was wondering, do you mind if I do that joke? I just, I just want to borrow it. Now, I'm a kid. I don't know any better. I'm like, borrow it? Well, I guess, sure, if it'll help your career. <laughs> I let him do the joke. And then weeks later, I was waiting to go on in a comedy club, and he went on before me, and he did the joke. And after the show, I pulled him aside and I said, hey, man, I don't mind you borrowing my jokes, but you got to give them back. <laughs> he said, oh, I forgot to ask you. He goes, let me buy that joke from you for $50. And I said, man, I'd do it, but I'm just starting out. I need all the material I can get. The idea being that the more material I can accumulate, the faster I'll be able to make money for my work. I said, I can't do it. I want my joke back. I'll never forget this. Remember, I was a 15-year-old child. This guy was a grown-ass man. He stood up over me so I could see how big he was. And he said to me, really? I can just take it. And he did. I got scared because I was a child. But I never forgot that. I never forgot that. I was 15 years old. I'm 47 now. I think about this guy all the time. When I look at my own kids and I see how young and innocent they are, I can't believe someone did that to me. And I don't think about it every day because that was the worst thing that happened to me. I think about it every day because that was the first time that someone ever did that to me. But in my career, it has happened many, many times since where someone would intimidate me or scare me and take something that I believe was mine. I'll tell you another story. Now I'm 18 years old. I'm living in New York City, and I just finished my first road tour, which was a very difficult tour. I'll spare you the details. Now I'm back in New York, but my rent is paid, thank God. And I have $60 to my name. And a woman that I had met in Pittsburgh, a bad Dominican bitch, <laughs> was coming to New York. She was going to spend the weekend with me. I couldn't wait for her to get there. She was coming that evening. But remember, I only had $60 for a whole weekend to entertain a bad bitch. Now I'm walking through Greenwich Village and I see something I've never seen before. Three-card Monty. 
You know what that is? Yeah, the guy had the whole thing. The table was set up, and he had the three cards, and the crowd was hooting and hollering, and he was like, find the red card, find the red card, and people were playing. Sometimes they win, sometimes they lose, but it was really exciting, and I'm standing there watching it, and I noticed while I'm watching them play this game that the red card, the one you're trying to find, had just a little bend on the corner. And I'm watching, and I'm like, yo, this guy doesn't seem to know that red card is bent. I'm going to beat this motherfucker. <laughs> and I walked up to the table, and I said, let me play a hand. And I put my last $60 on that table, and he starts to shuffle and find the red card, find the red card. And I kept watching that bent card go around the table, make sure I kept my eyes on that bent card. And when he stopped shuffling, and he said, find the red card, I pointed to it with confidence. Here it is right here. And he flipped it over, and it was black. And he took my money. I couldn't fucking believe that. How did this nigga do that? Was that magic or sorcery? I was confused. So you know what I did? I sat there, and I watched him for a real long time play the game. And I realized that all those people who was doing all that hooting and hollering and betting, my God, they were his friends. They were in on the whole thing. I felt so wronged. I felt so stupid. And then the next sucker came up to the table and was about to put his money down. And I said, fuck that, man. Don't put your money there. All these niggas is in on it. <laughs> it's a trick. And when I said that, the guy that was dealing, and this motherfucker was huge, snatched me up by my collar. Feel how strong he was when he grabbed me. I was a skinny little guy. And he was gonna maul me. And the only reason he didn't, I'm sure, is because he saw the fear in my face. And that fear, he looked at me. I saw his eyes go from hard to soft. He softened. Then he looked at me like the way a father would look at a child. And he said to me, young man, don't ever come between a man and his meal. I never forgot that either. Most niggas would have to run the streets for years to learn a lesson that profound. It took me two seconds. Never get between somebody and their paper. Taking a man's livelihood away from him is akin to killing him. Do you know why Prince, the famous rock star that was a friend of mine, do you know why he called himself the artist when he came back? He calls himself the artist because that's what they call us in our contracts. Oh, these contracts are crazy. You should hear the terminology they say in these contracts. To use your name and likeness and perpetuity throughout the universe. Who the fuck could possibly know what that means? <laughs> Nobody does. It's so complicated, in fact, that when you're a kid like me, you have to hire somebody to tell you what that means. And you sit down at a table and you do the contract game. And that's how I got with Comedy Central. I signed the contract. But I signed the contract the way that a 28-year-old expecting father that was broke signs a contract. I was desperate. I needed a way out. And it wasn't good money, and it wasn't good circumstances. But uh, what else am I going to do, I said. And all these white people sitting at that table told me, trust us, Dave, it's a good contract. And I looked around the table, and they all seemed to agree it was a good contract. But what if... What if it was like that game of three-card Monty? What if they were all friends and I didn't know it? And the bag of money was Iceberg's money in the first place. What was I talking about? What was I trying to tell you? Last week, two weeks ago, whenever it was, I called Lauren Michaels, 
and I tell him, okay, I'll do it. I'll do Saturday Night Live on election night. And, and the day I made that phone call, the day I committed to it, it gets announced that Netflix is streaming Chappelle's show. Not just Netflix. HBO Max is streaming it too. Let me tell you another story about HBO. No, hear me out. Did you know, before Chappelle's show was at Comedy Central, I pitched that show to HBO. I, I told them what I wanted to do. Now, these are executives. All they have to do is say, yeah, we'll take it, or no, thank you, we won't. But they didn't say either of those things. They went too far. They said, literally, what do we need you for? That's what they told me, as they kicked me out of the office. What do we need you for? And here we are, all these years later, and they're streaming the very show that I was pitching to them. So I'm asking them, what do you need me for? People think I made a lot of money for Chappelle's show. When I left that show, I never got paid. They didn't have to pay me because I signed the contract. But is that right? I found out that these people were streaming my work and they never had to ask me or they never had to tell me. Perfectly legal because I signed the contract. But is that right? I didn't think so either. That's why I like working for Netflix. I like working for Netflix because when all those bad things happened to me, that company didn't even exist. <laughs> and when I found out they were streaming Chappelle's show, I was furious. How could they not, how could they not know? So you know what I did? I called them and I told them that this makes me feel bad. And do you want to know what they did? They agreed that they would take it off their platform just so I could feel better. That's why I fuck with Netflix. Because they paid me my money, they do what they say they're gonna do, and they went above and beyond what you could expect from a businessman. They did something just because they thought that I might think that they were wrong. And I, I do. I think if, if you are fucking streaming that show, you're fencing stolen goods. They stole that from me. They just took it. And I'm not up here trying to tell you guys that I believe that Comedy Central gave me a raw deal just because I'm black. I believe that they gave me a raw deal because this fucking industry is a monster. It's the same monster that these Me Too bitches was trying to tell you about. But they hate the monster for how it fucks. And I hate that monster for how it eats. But my God, man, it's the same monster. When I quit the show, all my friends would say, well, then fuck them, Dave. Why don't you just do Chappelle's show at another network? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And why doesn't a slave run from one plantation to another plantation because the master over there might be nicer? My God, man, I was trapped. You know what? Tell you the truth. Tell you the truth. I've even thought about coming back and doing another Chappelle show. Well... But if I do, I can't call it Chappelle's show because my name and likeness is being used by them in perpetuity throughout the universe. It's in the contract. <laughs> You're not supposed to do this in my business. I'm up here doing something that nobody else in this business has the balls to do. I'm telling you something that you need to know. I'm trying to explain to you what you're seeing. You don't understand what you're seeing. 
I am publicly flogging a network. And I know that this network niggas, they, they watching me and they saying, why, why, why are you doing this so, so publicly? Doesn't feel good to be flogged publicly. Oh, believe me, I know. I know exactly how that feels. When I quit my show, they said I was crazy. What was crazy about it? I just didn't want to do it anymore. They said I smoked crack. That's impossible. I was a devout Muslim. I didn't smoke or drink. But I do now, bitch, because you ruined my fucking life. <laughs> now it's their turn. This is their first nigga lesson. And I'm honored to give it to them. They're going to pay me for this show. I called my agent. I said, is there anything I can do about this show? And he said, no. Well, fuck you too then. If you want something done right, I guess you got to do it yourself. So I'm not going to the agents. I'm coming to my real boss. I'm coming to you. I'm begging you. If you ever liked me, if you ever think there was anything worthwhile about me, I'm begging you, please don't watch that show. I'm not asking to boycott any network. Boycott me. Boycott Chappelle's show. Do not watch it unless they pay me. If you're a shareholder, at Viacom, then I'm talking to you. Because all that shit that they do to us, well, they do everything for their shareholders. That's what they told me. So if you're a shareholder in that company, tell them it's wrong. And if you don't believe that it's wrong, then fuck you too. You should know what's in the hot dogs you eat. Now, there's probably a bunch of people at Comedy Central and Viacom and all these places that have no idea what I'm talking about. They've all either quit or been fired or got me too or something. Them niggas is gone. <laughs> and there's a whole bunch of new young people there and they're probably looking like, what is he talking about? They may not actually know what the fuck happened to me. So I'll tell you what I'm talking about. Go downstairs to your accounting department, open the books, see what that show made, and look at what you paid me. That's exactly what I'm talking about. You're going to pay me. I am inviting you to come with me and work with me, and let's fight against that terrible, terrible feeling that you made me feel together. We can fight together and work this thing with Chappelle show out. Or... Or I can just take it. Thank you.